There you go. Exodus chapter 18 this morning, if you have your Bibles, Exodus chapter 18. We are talking about the church through learning about Israel. And as we do that, we keep in mind that God's purpose and aim is to overcome the problem of sin that entered the world in Genesis 3. And that God then, in many ways, is solving a family problem. That's really at least one way to think of it, because God is the father of humanity. Uh, Zechariah 12, 1 says that God formed the spirit of man within him. In Hebrews 12, 9, the Bible refers to God as the father of spirits. Paul says in Acts 17 and verse 29, we are his offspring. And so I say that because Israel is also God's family. From that general sense of the creation of humanity to a more special sense in that God called a person, Abram, and then made this nation that he will declare his very own, a people for his own possession. They will be God's family. As we project that out further to the Lord's church, also then, God's spiritual family. That's how the church will be described. Ephesians 3.15 and 1 Timothy 3.15 and 16, the family of God, the household of God. When we left the nation of Israel, we left them murmuring and complaining. That's what we studied in Exodus, the end of 15, 16, and 17. And I tell you all of that about family because that's really the title of our sermon this morning, Family Matters. And what we're going to study this morning is some internal then family issues within the nation of Israel and see how those can relate to us as the Lord's church today. But a few things we didn't discuss, and such is the nature of Bible study. It can, it can get deep and it can get involved. And as a result of that, sometimes you, you just don't get to discuss everything. A couple of things we didn't discuss, I'll just mention them and then we'll get to chapter 18. Back in chapter 16, there was the principle of giving discussed, at least kind of introduced. It's in the collection of the manna. If you were to read Exodus 16, verses 13 to 18, it will be outlined how they are to go gather the manna. And ultimately, they were to only get enough, only so much for a day. They were not to get overage. Now, I tell you that because if you have your Bibles, look over in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the Apostle Paul will be talking about discussing the collection for the saints who are suffering there in Jerusalem and are in need, and he will hearken back to that event. Down in about verse number 12, now it's much more than this. We could read the first 15 verses. I think you'd get the whole thing, but in verse number 12, he says, for if the readiness is present, King James says, for if there first be a willing mind, it is accepted according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. For this is not the case of others, ease others in your, for your affliction, but by way of equality. At this present time, your abundance being a supply for their needs, so that their abundance also may become a supply for your need, that there may be equality. As it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little had no lack. And so there is a principle there established in this collection of manna that it's based on what a person has, not what he lacks. And it's not to ease one person and burden another, but that giving is based on what you have to give and that everybody should do that according to what they have, Paul says, so that there is equality. That comes from Exodus 16. Another thing we didn't discuss is uh, chapter 17, verses 8 to 16, and that is the fighting of the Amalekites. The Amalekites came out and fought against Israel while Israel was not prepared for war. And God was very displeased with Amalek for that, and he told Moses, write this down. I will remember it. Well, when you get over the 1 Samuel chapter 15, if you have your Bibles, look there quickly. We'll go there and just look at a few verses. And this really sets the, the scene and, and, and really determines a lot of the events in Israel among their first couple of kings, between King Saul and King David. It's this event. 
Chapter 15 and verse number 1, Then Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people of Israel. Now therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he set himself against him on the way while he was coming up from Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek. This command is based on what happens in Exodus chapter 17, and Saul's failure there ultimately will stop him from being king. In fact, if you were to read chapter 15, you'll go right into chapter 16, and by chapter 16, the prophet is at Jesse's home looking for a new king. He has rejected God, and God has rejected him. Those are the events back there in Exodus 17. Allow that to bring us to chapter 18 for our sermon this morning. Also, surrounding the people of the nation. God is mentioned, though he will not speak here within these verses we'll discuss. Moses is front and center. Jethro's father-in-law is present. Zipporah, Moses' wife, is there along with his sons. These are the first. This is verses 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, right in that section. His sons are mentioned by name. One is Gershom. Moses says, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. The other is Eliezer. The God of my father was my help and delivered me, Moses says. That's verse 2, 3, 4, right in that section. This setting, Jethro is coming to meet Moses. He's bringing his family back to him. At one point, Moses' family went with him to Egypt, back in chapter 4, verses 18 to 20. And it's on that trip that Zipporah actually saves Moses' life by circumcising their son, chapter 4, 24 to 26. At some point, Moses sent them back home to Jethro. And now Jethro is bringing them back. That's verse number 2. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Moses' wife Zipporah after he had sent her away and her two sons. And so there is a reuniting of this family together. In this chapter, the first half of it at any rate, Moses' service to Israel, Israel's problems, and Jethro's counsel are all discussed. An outline of the chapter would go this way. Jethro will meet Moses. That's the first seven verses. Moses will relay God's goodness to Jethro, verses 8 to 12, and Moses will judge the people. That's verses 13 to 16. That's as, as, um, that's as much of the chapter as we can discuss this morning, and so we invite you to come back this evening for the rest of the chapter, and we'll focus on the things it says about leadership in that section. To those first three sections then, some lessons and applications from each one. Lesson number one, God's will was being accomplished. God was being made known. Notice verse number one. The Bible says, now Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. If you go back in your mind, please remember that they didn't know God. This was the problem. And as a result of that, God was going to make himself known to them. How would he do that? He's actually going to do that through bringing them out of, the, out of Egyptian bondage, but also by judging Pharaoh and his people. When Pharaoh said, I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go, chapter 5, verse 1 and verse number 2, God's response to that was, by this you will know. And the subsequent actions of God and those plagues were to the end that they would know that God is the God of heaven and earth. And you could read that throughout those first several chapters. It's in chapter 6, 7, 8, 9, 9, 10, 11, 4. It's throughout. God keeps saying, by this, you will know. At one point, God said to Pharaoh, for this purpose, I raised you up. Now, when you hear that, for some people, it seems like God is on some ego trip, and that's the way they talk about him, that he would raise up Pharaoh to show his power, that he brought the plagues to declare his name. 
that he showed his power to demonstrate his greatness. And for some people, that bothers them. They began to think, well, he's rather bullish, don't you think? They might even muse if he wanted to let Israel get out of Egypt, why didn't he just do it? Were the plagues really necessary? Was the death of Pharaoh's child really necessary? You mean to tell me he raised Pharaoh up to put Pharaoh down? They might even suggest he's not very nice. I've heard people describe God this way. That the God of the Old Testament, they say, is mean-spirited and vindictive. And how could he do this sort of thing? Almost with an air of self-righteousness, they suggest, I wouldn't have done it that way because I'm much nicer than that. I suppose on the one hand, it's not the case that God is above being questioned. But I would say quickly, on the other hand, God is above being questioned. Now, how can he be both above being questioned and be allowed to be questioned? Here's the thing. God is not above being questioned in the sense that God allows people to question him. And sometimes he answers. Abraham questioned God. God gave an answer. People have questioned God, and he's answered, so he's not above being questioned. On the other hand, he's above being questioned because nobody really sits in a higher position. Nobody is in a more moral position. Nobody is above God, and therefore, everyone who questions him is less knowledgeable than he is. Everybody who's questioned him is less holy than he is. Everybody who questioned him is less loving and less righteous and ultimately, everybody who questions him needs him. So in a very real sense, he is above being questioned. If you think that declaring his name through Pharaoh in Egypt was bullish, then you'd be wrong. The plagues, the parting of the sea, the defeat of Pharaoh were not exclusively about God being known for the sake of being known. Why did God do these things then? Truth is, he did them so he could save us. You look at Romans chapter 1, and as Paul describes these people, he says, that which could be known of God was known because he manifested to them. But they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. And they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for mortal things made like man and four-footed beasts. They knew God, they cast him off, and as a result of going into idolatry, they didn't know him. Egypt didn't know him. Israel didn't know him. Rahab, none of the world knew him. Abraham came from idolatry, Joshua 24, 1 and 2. Even when the Christ came, people didn't know God. Acts 8, 9, and 10, Simon deceived them with sorcery. Acts 14, 8 to 18, they believed Zeus and Hermes had come down. Acts 17, 22 to 31, Paul says, you have so many gods, you even wrote an inscription to the unknown God. Acts 19, Diana is believed by the Ephesians. The Thessalonians, Paul says, turn from dumb idols to the living God. God making himself known was so that he could save the very people who cast him off. You can't be saved if you don't know God. Thank God he made himself known to the world, and it was working. Because Jethro says to Moses, I've heard. I've heard all that God has done. Friends, if you don't know God, you can't serve God. Thank God he made himself known. Lesson number two. This is verses 8 down to verse number 12. Moses relays difficulties and deliverance. What's the lesson here? God's people should acknowledge difficulties and proclaim deliverance. Moses says this in verse number 8. Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, and all the hardship that had befallen them on the journey, and how the Lord had delivered 
them. Moses relays difficulties and deliverance to Jethro. What I want you to see next is the effect that has on Jethro. You see from verse 9 nearly following, it's Jethro's reaction that's recorded. The Bible says in verse number 9, upon hearing that, Jethro rejoiced over all the goodness which the Lord had done to Israel in delivering them from the hand of the Egyptians. Secondly, so Jethro said, blessed be the Lord who delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of Pharaoh and who delivered the people under the hand of the Egyptians. Verse 11, now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. Indeed, it was proven when they dealt proudly against the people. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God, and Aaron came and all the elders eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law before God. Four things the Bible says. Moses said to Jethro, here are the hardships we encountered, and the Lord delivered us from all of them. Jethro rejoiced. Jethro praised God. He now has knowledge of God. Now I know. And then Jethro himself submits and goes and worships and sacrifices God. We sing and we say, our God is an awesome God. He reigns where? In heaven above. We quote passages like Daniel, the most high rules in the kingdoms of men. And then we encounter hardships. What happens then? You know where we found the children of Israel when they encountered hardship? We read it back there at the end of 15, 16, and 17. They murmured and they complained. Instead of that, they should have been proclaiming deliverance. Jesus taught us from the very beginning, if you serve me faithfully, you will suffer, Matthew 5, 10 to 16. What needs to happen is we need to choose to have a spiritual perspective toward problems. Well, what does that look like? On the one hand, we acknowledge that difficulties and troubles and sorrows are real. We don't go around saying, well, we just don't claim it. We don't go around saying, well, it's not really real. It's only in your mind. No, it's real. Water is wet. And I was growing up, I was told fat meat is greasy. The stuff is real. We don't go around living in denial. Difficulties are real, but they shouldn't define us. What we should proclaim is God delivers. That's what we should proclaim. What happens is people will hear us. People will see us. When problems arise, as you read throughout the New Testament, the, the disciples, the Christians, the apostles' reactions are recorded to hardship. This is the kind of disposition one should have who suffers for the cause of Christ. Look at Acts chapter 5. If you were to read Acts chapter 5, of course, we'd encourage you to start at Acts 1 and read over. But if you don't do that, at least know that chapter 4, they're arrested. Chapter 4, they're threatened. And chapter 5, they're beaten. And the end of chapter 5 records their reaction to the beating. After Gamaliel has spoken, verse 40 says, they took his advice, and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them, ordered them that they were not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then they released them. Verse 41 says, so they went out on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on preaching and teaching Jesus is the Christ. Go over to Acts chapter 16 and listen to a man talk after he's been arrested falsely, after he's been beaten unjustly, and then thrown into the inner prison. What would you find such an attitude that this man would have? Chapter 16, verse 25, the Bible says, but about midnight, Paul and Silas was praying and singing hymns of praise to God. But it's the last part that you should really focus on. Because the Bible says, and the prisoners were listening to them. I hope that you appreciate that people listen to you and that people watch you. 
after they find out that you're a member of the Lord's church, after they hear you say, I'm a Christian, after that, they will watch you and they will listen to you. And it's great to be a Christian in peacetime. It's great to sing God's praises in the calm. But what will they hear when you are in the storm? Please know they're listening and they're watching. And what they hear will tell them a lot about both your religion and your God. In Philippians chapter 1, we don't have to guess about what the Apostle Paul thinks about his imprisonment. We don't have to wonder about the way it made him feel. He was singing and praying, yes, but this is what he wrote. Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 12, he says, Now I want you to know, brethren, that the things that have happened unto me have fallen out unto the furtherance or the greater progress of the gospel so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout all the whole praetorium guard and to everyone else. And that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. When I'm in trouble, will people be encouraged by what they hear and see? or will they be discouraged? Paul says, when they saw me in my imprisonment, it encouraged the brethren. They were more faithful, more bold, more confident the way we handled the difficulty. Why? Because our God delivers. The fact is, God's people should always proclaim deliverance. In fact, it's nearly all we read in the Bible. Noah is in the flood, delivered. Abraham's in idolatry, delivered. From war, from family, from Abimelech who took his wife. What about Sarah? From idolatry, from her own devices, from being barren, delivered. Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, David, Rahab, Ruth, Esther, Hannah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, Israel, Nehemiah, the prophets, the apostles, the church. What were they? Delivered. We read Hebrews, through, Hebrews 11, and we quote it, and we read it, and what does it say? Deliver, 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 and then us. What happens next? Has he delivered you? What are you going to proclaim? What do people hear us say? What do people see us do? What do they think of our God? Moses said to Jethro, here are the hardships we endured, and the Lord deliver us. And Josh Jethro said, now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods. Indeed, it was proven when they dealt proudly against the people. Before we leave this point, let me make one more point, and that is this. The difficulties Moses related to Jethro didn't come from God. They came from man. The difficulties you encounter, they don't come from God. They come from man. But amazingly, the deliverance comes from God. Now, why would we proclaim anything else? God doesn't bring the problems, but he delivers. James chapter 1 and verse 17, James says, Every good and perfect gift is from above. Cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God doesn't bring bad gifts to his children. God doesn't do that. God doesn't do that. God brings good gifts to his children, everyone. But God delivers. Point number three. Point number three centers around disagreements because God's people have disagreements. It happens. Moses was dealing with that. God's people see things differently. Remember now, it's a nation, but it's also a family. God's chosen. God's called out. What's the church? Same thing. What happens? Sometimes we see things differently. Is that a problem? Not necessarily. Romans 14 allows for it. 1 Corinthians 8 through 10 allow for judgments, opinions, even strongly held convictions. It allows for that. God's people disagree. Paul urged Eodia and Syntyche not to, not, not to, to, to find unity, Philippians 4.2. 
God's people wrong one another. Here, note it in verse 13. It came about the next day that Moses sat to judge the people. What's he going to do? He's judging, he's governing, he's, he's vindicating, he's punishing, he's making some, some judgments here, he's deciding matters. It came about the next day that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood before Moses from morning until evening. Notice verse 16. When they have a dispute, well, that's what's happening. It comes to me, and I judge between a man and his neighbor and make known the statutes of God and his laws. When Moses says, they come before me with disputes, okay, some Israelites are having disputes. It happens within families, happens here within the nations, happens within the church. What is it that they do? Moses says they come to me. Now, why? Notice again, when they come in verse 15, because the people come to me to inquire of God. So we have a dispute. We go see Moses. What does Moses have? Access to God. Moses then will tell us what God says. That'll settle a dispute. Notice verse 16. When they have a dispute, it comes to me, and I judge between a man and his neighbor and make known the statutes of God and his laws. What's the lesson? God's word should settle disputes. People have disputes within the family. Let's go to God and see what he says. Well, all disputes aren't equal. I understand that. That happens. Notice verse number 22. When they're talking about getting other people to help Moses, he says, let them judge the people at all times. Let it be that every major dispute they will bring to you, but every minor dispute they themselves will judge. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. We'll talk some more about that tonight, but clearly not every dispute is the same. We understand that. Ultimately, though, God's Word should settle the disputes. Here is the point of application with regards to the church. I must check myself in disputes. Notice Philippians chapter 2 with me. The first thing I need to check is my attitude in disputes. In Philippians chapter 2, please understand this as we, as we turn there. Please understand that this is God's nation and that there is one law for everybody. All of Israel are under the law of Moses. Well, what about the new covenant? All of spiritual Israel under the new covenant of Jesus Christ. In other words, nobody's exempted. Everybody is to check himself or herself in this area. When it comes to disputes, I have to check my attitude, first of all. Begin reading with me there in verse number 1 of Philippians 2. Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, in intent on one purpose. Everybody has to be that way. Well, how is my attitude? Notice verse number three. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Who is to do that? I have to check myself in disputes. Everybody has to do that. Sometimes some members of the Lord's body act as if they're exempted somehow from certain aspects of these things. Nobody's exempt. Everybody is to behave in this way. It's what makes the nation special. It's what makes the nation different. It's the God of the nation that makes the nation. And they're to be like the God who brought them out of Egyptian bondage or out of a sinful world into the kingdom of his dear son. And so now we have a dispute. Okay, we said we're going to acknowledge it. We admit it. We disagree. Fine. What's my attitude? I have to be humble. But who else has to be humble? Who else has to be mindful and regard one another as more important than themselves? Who has to do that? The two people in dispute. What else do they need to do? Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also the interests of others. Have this attitude in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant. Here's the question I have to ask myself. I'm in a dispute with one of God's children, my brother, my sister. Do I prefer him? 
do I think they're more important than me? I'm in a dispute with one of God's children, my brother, my sister. Am I going to humble myself? I'm in a dispute with one of God's children, my brother, my sister. Can I serve? Don't you look out on the interests of your own. Don't, don't do that. But in lowliness of mind, esteem others. It's not just my attitude. I'd have to check mine, though. I'd have to check my motivation. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. What am I hoping to accomplish? I'm going to get them told, well, that would violate everything in Ephesians 4. I'm going to have my way that would violate everything in Philippians 2. Ephesians 4 says, therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling in which you have been called. With all, there it is again, humility, gentleness, patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity. I don't care if we blow this place up. Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What's my motivation? What's the end goal for me? To burn it all down? To say it doesn't matter? To just rip the place up as long as I get my way? That's not at all what God is saying. It would violate everything God is. It would violate everything God says. I'd have to check my attitude, have to check my motivation. I have to check my actions. What am I doing? Stay in Ephesians 4 and look at the end of the chapter. And verse 32 says, be kind to one another. But we're in a dispute. That's absolutely right. And what should you do? You be kind in the dispute. To whom? One another. I can't be kind, but you can't be like Jesus. Do you remember when you read Matthew 27 and Jesus grabbed Judas by the collar and told him, are you going to betray? You remember reading that? Oh, that's right. You didn't read that. He let him go. What you do, do quickly. You remember when Peter drew that sword and cut off the right ear of Malchus, how Jesus just told Peter, I have no more. Oh, no, he didn't do that. He picked up the ear and put it back on his head. You remember how Jesus stood before Pilate and called down lightning and thunder? How dare you think you could just—oh, no, he didn't say anything. That's what he did. You mean you can't act like Jesus because you're—no. You be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. My attitude, my motivation, my actions, my approach to God is in play when we are in disputes. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, when Paul is talking about this very thing, they're taking one another to court, they're doing this for trivial, small matters, they're, they're, they're shaming the church of God, and they're, they're causing all of these issues for the Lord's church because they're having disputes one with another. Brother go before law. That's verse 6 of verse chapter 6. Brother goes to law with brothers that before unbelievers. And then he says this in verse number 7. Actually then, there is already a defeat for you. You've already lost. How did you lose already? The fact that you have these lawsuits with one another. But then he says this. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? If shaming the Lord's church, if denigrating the body of Christ, if man just absolutely destroying the image and beauty of Christ before the world means you have to take wrong, Paul says, why not? Why would you rather not just be defrauded before you just drug the beautiful bride of Christ through the streets of the world? Why would you not do that? Why not just take the wrong? Why not be defrauded before you abuse the beautiful, precious bride of Christ? In this same chapter, just like Moses in Exodus 18, Paul says faithful brethren could help you. Isn't there somebody there? God gave Israel Moses. God gives the church elders, 
They're there. Isn't there somebody there? Go talk. Go sit. Go open the Word of God. Go get some counsel, but don't destroy the bride of Christ. Scripture is very clear. God watches his children's behavior toward each other. Just like parents at home. How often have you seen your children? It went from play to harm. And when you saw the crossover, you said, hey, 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 oh, oh, mm mm. We don't hurt each other. We love each other. Nobody here in our family is going to harm any other member in our family. Parents watch out for that sort of thing. Parents intervene in that sort of thing. You know God says the exact same thing. He sees what we do to one another. Romans 12, 17 to 21 Matthew 7, 1 to 5, a host of other passages. God is looking. What would happen if every member behaved like Jesus to every member? I played a little basketball in my life, just a little bit. And it's, it's like when you go a little bit up you lose sight of the fundamentals more and more. And so the higher you get, the better you think you are in your mind, the, the less attention you give to the fundamentals. So we, we were at the All-Marine tryout camp, and they brought a coach in, and he was going to help us get better. And the first thing he said is, okay, you know, line up. We're going to learn how to box out. And we all thought, <laughs> that's, like, that's funny. That's third-grade stuff. Nobody box out. So and that was the exact problem. <laughs> He said, when the ball gets shot, go find a person, box them out, get between them and the basket. It was as fundamental as basketball can get. He said, what should happen is when that ball is shot and everybody puts a body on a man, the ball should hit the floor or go to someone on the inside of the circle. Fundamental, one-on-one kind of stuff. You know what Christianity has at its core? Fundamental, one-on-one kind of stuff. Let's all be like Jesus. What would happen if we were all like Jesus? What kind of people would we be? What kind of nation would the world see and say of those people? You know, they would say, that's a people like no other people. They serve a God like no other God. And they might just say, I need to be one of those people. What a light we would shine. What a blessing we would provide if we act just like Jesus. In both covenants, God's children, God's people are family. <laughs> Members in a family sometimes disagree and have issues with each other, but the family is able to settle disputes by the word of the Father. The Bible says we're members one of another. For each of us, let's behave like Jesus. And what a blessing it'll be to us and to the world. If you're not a Christian this morning, you need to become one. You need to be a Christian. We began by saying that God is solving a problem. Ultimately, he is. The problem of sin in the person of Christ. He'll use this nation to bring the Christ to die for the sins of the world. And friends, if you haven't obeyed the gospel, your problem persists. Because if you don't come to Jesus, you can't be forgiven. And so he invites the very God that men turn their back on, the very God they reject is the very God who seeks to save. Would you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Would you change your heart and your mind and repent? Would you confess his name and be immersed in water, baptized for the forgiveness of your sins? We offer an invitation at the end of every sermon with the intent and the hope that when we sing this song, if you need to, you will come down front we will greet you, ask you a few questions, but if that's your desire, we would love to help you come to know Jesus this very morning by obedience to the gospel. If you are his child and you've lived in a way that's not pleasing to your heavenly father, friends, we're not the world. The church is not a denomination. It's not one of many. It's the Lord's church and his people, and we're called to be different. 
because ultimately we're called to act like Jesus. Let us all commit to that, to the glory of God. If we can help you in any way this morning, we invite you to come as we stand and as we sing.